Welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa, where your panelists discuss thought-provoking topics in an atmosphere of seriousness, decisiveness, and laughter. Here we call a speed a speed, and like we say here, no holds barred. Today, I'm advocating for the inclusion of people with disabilities in all walks of life. Raymond is here to tell us about Nigeria's elusive search for nationhood, and finally, Anyton is talking about the various social cultures in Nigeria. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Physical disability is not inability. James was physically impaired after a near fatal road accident. He has lived his life to the fullest capacity, living with the challenges of accessibility in a society that treats disabled people like third class citizens. It is reported that there are over 27 million Nigerians living with some form of disability with physical impairment coming in at the third most common disability. The World Health Organization's 2011 World Disability Report states that about 15% of Nigerian's population, or at least 27 million people, have a disability, and many of them face several human rights abuses, including stigma, discrimination, violence and lack of access to health care, housing and education. And even in 2021, this number has not changed much. As though this is not enough bias, they are unable to get into a building in most cities in the country, thereby limiting their quality of life. Now, on January 23rd, 2018, Nigerian President Mohamed Buhari signed into law the Disability Prohibition Act after years of advocacy and protests by advocacy group. Of note in the bill is that the act prohibits all forms of discrimination against people with disabilities. If an individual is found violating this law, he or she will pay a fine of 100,000 naira or a term of six months imprisonment. The law also imposes several penalties across other provisions of the law and covers for many areas of infringement, including authorization for buildings without disability access, 5% of employment opportunities going, should go to disabled people, ability to litigate against any discrimination, and Section 31 of the Act provides for the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities who will enforce and promote the rights of disabled people. It's pertinent to note that it has taken almost 20 years for this bill to be signed, and I dare say this gives an indication of how discriminatory we are, as though a disabled person is somewhat a lesser citizen. Bills and regulations are only the first step, but as a society and people, we must have a consciousness of how our ignorance and lackadaisical attitude limits a significant population of our country. When was the last time you hired or referred a disabled person for a job? How many disabled people work in your organization? Have you tried to go into a building and realize that there's no wheelchair ramp, disabled parking, lifts, toilets, or other facilities for such people? Disability should not be a limitation in this country. We need to make a leapfrog attempt to better support this demographic to unlock untapped potential in 15% of our population. <laughs> I must say, um, it is quite a touching topic you have picked on to talk about today. And I will be honest and confess that the general reaction and the feeling that comes up within me and I'm sure maybe a number of people is first of all to want to shy away from it yeah. to kind of recoil and the you know how we are quite religious as a people that oh no you know that sense of wanting it not to come near you but it's a topic and a conversation that is sensitive and urgent and a call to action because uh, with the line where you actually ask the question how many disabled people have been referred or even employed and i did a mental recap and i really can't recall working with any disabled person 
in a long time. Exactly. And this is a career that's probably spanned over 15 years. And I was like, wow, this is not really very encouraging. And I guess I dare say it's a good call to action for all of us to take note of as, as people. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm sure maybe Raymond had a different set of reactions <laughs> from my reaction, but I definitely oh, yeah, was yeah. quite, um, you know. <sighs> well, I couldn't have had, anybody should have a different um, reaction because um, the reality just stares at you in the face. Just like you started pointing out, the last line of the advocacy that, that was like a soul searching for each and every one of us out there. When was mm -hmm. the last time you hired mm -hmm. someone or why you refer someone who is disabled to any organization? Mm -hmm. So that speaks to our collective responsibility in this social um, minutes, as it were. Mm. And this, the number she reeled out there, 25% of Nigerian population, that's... 15, yeah. Yeah, that means at least one out of every 10% is disabled in Nigeria. That's a lot. So that puts in context hmm. the number, the sheer number of this group of persons in this society. And yeah. we can't afford to actually um, not put, not, not um, factor the peculiarities of their condition yeah. in social planning. Mm. And everything yeah. in telecommunications. Even before the, I'll commend the president, the, the, the coming into, the, the signing into law of the um, disability uh, legislation. It's actually a step in, pro, in progress after a long time where this group of persons have been limited to just advocating within their perhaps small, smaller groups. Uh, that legislation for the first time has put that issue as um, in the front burner of mm -hmm. national mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. And also, I like to point out that. In recent times, I, I begin to notice some form of institutional um, concern True, around right. people who are disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, a case in point is this. Um, recently, the Nigerian Bar Association at the last NEC meeting, the MBA president, Mr. Olubi Dakpata, created a, a whole forum for disabled persons. That's, fantastic. That's interesting. Yeah. That's fantastic. Sections of persons mm -hmm. with disabilities. True. And it's within the legal profession. Mm. You know, it will cater to people in this group so mm. that you, they will organize for themselves and also mm. push uh, advocacy uh, to better make their, 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 their interest heard. And then also the Electoral Act that is being proposed to resign, to resign law any, any day has also made provision for uh, persons living with disabilities in polling centers, wards and coalition centers. So uh, I'm beginning to see a kind of institutional awareness uh, about the plight of this category of persons in uh, society. But like I pointed out, the conversation will continue. And on our own part, we have to do our own uh, uh, part of the job by actually um, going out of the way to make deliberate steps towards um, advising organizations. How about we employ someone who is disabled? You understand? So yes. we need two steps mm -hmm. go a long way. You know? mm -hmm. Yes. Creating that sense of inclusion which has been lacking for a long time. You know, this particular advocacy for me, right, it's, it's, it, it's more, it, for me, I want the burden to be on us. Mm. I want it to be on us. We have a mm. lot of rules and regulations in mm -hmm. this country, but it all comes down to enforcement. Yeah. But the truth is that there's a role of the government in nation building, right? And then there's a role of citizens. Mm. If we look at a certain 15% of the demographic and we say, oh, because the person is on a wheelchair, mm. then suddenly we forget the person's intellect. We That's forget true. the person's ability to contribute mm. intelligently to conversations. Mm and mm -hmm. to projects. Yes, I know that there are limitations on, of working in specific roles by virtue of their disability. However, what about everything except the actual physical activity? Mm. Yeah. A lot of value comes from the strategy point of view, from the planning point of view. Execution is last mile, really. So there's no reason why organizations shouldn't start to employ people like that. I don't remember working with any disabled person. And for me, it's, 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 I'm like, why? I know people that you know, are on a wheelchair and they are smarter than most people that I know. When you engage them in conversations, they have phenomenal ideas, yeah. but these doors have just been shut to them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so this particular advocacy, it's on us. We need to start to have, you know, we can't continue to pretend that it doesn't exist yeah. until sure it comes that. close to us. Maybe yeah. somebody in our family and then suddenly we mm. get angry, right? Yeah. This whole, the whole purpose of this is that we are looking out for each other as citizens of this country. The government is not going to do anything for us. And this one, the government has nothing to do with it. Sure. You're yeah, right. You're right about that. Yeah. And I think really maybe one thing, one area that would really help is to actually remove the stigmatization. You know how it is that already people just feel like a person with a disability should be stigmatized. It's almost like, like there was something you said that struck at me, hit me, that 
the disability, physical disability, does not actually take away from their capacity yeah. or their thinking or their abilities to do things. Yeah. And the minute we can begin to push that as people and make it front burner, it might help with removing the stigma. Because I've come to realize in advocacy that sometimes if you're not able to sell the benefit or the value of something, advocating for it becomes slightly more difficult. Yeah. But just yeah. as you put it that way, it hit me that, you know what? They are actually smart. It's a physical disability, it. not a mental disability. Exactly. And it only prevents some activities like, okay, you know what, entering into a place. And good thing, technology, remote working, virtual working, those are all values that add to your intellectual space. The idea of the workplace. I'm telling you. So I think all disability advocates have a field day pushing for disabled people to be able to earn more in the workplace. Yeah, well, to just um, put in more context what you guys have said, of course, um, the point you made about that the fact of them being disabled does not take away their, um, their intellectual makeup. Yeah. Uh, there is this popular saying that disability is not inability. Yeah, true. We have seen that being uh, displayed in a very graphic way in the Paralympics. That yeah. very true. Yeah. Very true. Very yeah. true. Yeah. How they have with their disability and they're doing exploit. Yeah. Yeah. So that means um this group of persons uh, we are no better than them because for That's now true. we still have our limbs and whatever mm. intact. We could also be like them the next moment. So it's always good to actually um put them in the front of us to share this course. You know the, I also now that you talked about you know limbs we, you know, what we can also even start to do is when organizations are talking about corporate social responsibility mm -hmm. and they have budgets, what about we even put this money towards, you know, provision of prosthetic limbs for people like this? Yeah, but well, you know, there are organizations that are doing that already. But those are NGOs, are they not? Well, true them? that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so you talk about corporate, yeah. So yes. maybe, there, maybe that's a call to the corporate society yes. as well. That What are you doing with your CSR budget and your funding? Yes. 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 Good, 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 good idea. Good idea. Good conversation. Up okay. next is Raymond. Stay with us. Nigeria's elusive search for nationhood. If anyone was under any illusion of Nigeria's nation state status, the Muhammad Buhari administration in its six years so far must have helped to cure that illusion, even if in the most unfortunate of circumstances. It is not that Nigerians ever had a consensus about the idea of Nigeria as a geographical space where the potentials of each member of the diverse nationalities comprised within it can thrive as members of a common national destiny. Not at all. Even in its infancy, the young Nigeria was described as no more than a geographical expression by one of her founding fathers. What the Buhari regime has come to make us realize is how divided we are, having done a bad job of mismanaging or managing our diversity in the last six years. Some critics have had to argue that at no other time was Nigeria so divided in her history than now, and you couldn't help but agree with them. I was moved to deep reflection recently against the backdrop of all the depressing news in the country. And I couldn't help but come to the conviction that Nigeria might just be battling a crisis of nationhood, a situation which reinforces the convictions of separatist agitators who would rather the divergent nationalities constituted in Nigeria go their separate ways. The North-South divide has grown so wide in recent months owing to inability of leaders and followers to reach a consensus on critical national debates, such as system of animal husbandry, power rotation, freedom of speech, ETC. The alleged entitlement mentality of the North and the seemingly marginalization of the South, of the South particularly the Southeast, has created a sense of exclusion, whereby some people are seen as less Nigerian than the others. One of the unintended consequences of this social disequilibrium is the emergence of the we versus them mentality, where truth and objectivity is now a function of group and tribal solidarity. Amidst the bedlam over the suspension of Twitter, I noticed with concern the conspiratorial silence of the North and her so-called intelligentsia, while the South was agog with condemnation of it. 
On the other hand, I also observed the rearrest of Mazi Nambikanu and the raid on Sunday Ibuho's residence were hailed by the North, while the South expectedly rose in condemnation of sin. One question that has emerged from all of this is, how do we build a nation? Perhaps another way to phrase the question might as well be, are we supposed to be a nation? For if after 60 years of independence, the two distinct protectorates that became the country Nigeria as we know it today are unable to achieve a pan-consensus on critical and basic issues of nationhood, then it may not be out of place to take a second look at this colonial experiment. It has also been suggested in some quarters that since the clannish nature of President Muhammad Buhari is largely responsible for this level of division in the land, working towards a post-Buhari era should be the collective preoccupation of all and sundry. But whether that would not amount to kicking the proverbial can down the road is another thing altogether. I, I don't know if it would be discouraging to say that I do not know what it would take for us to actually be a nation. I'm not of the school of thought that there should be a separation, okay? Because I'm not exactly sure what purpose it would serve. Um, whether or not we like it, um, all the regions in this country have benefited one thing or the other from the other regions. However, it's a real thing, right? People are genuinely concerned about their place in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Genuinely so. Um, I, I, I grew up in, in the south, in the, in the south south. I'm from the southeast. But I was never aware of my tribe until I moved to the southwest. And this is still the south. So that makes you a bit concerned because the first thing you see is you see, you see my tribe before you see me. Yes. Before you see what I have to offer. Before you see the value I bring to anything. And that's the same sentiment across all the different tribes of the country. And so now all these things that are happening is when something happens that is against the sovereignty of the nation or you know, a national problem, people are not looking at the problem. People are looking at who did it. Exactly. If some boys were caught doing drugs, the first thing people are looking at, what tribe? Where is it from? Where is it from? So we're so divided as a nation that I really don't know how we're going to get past it. I don't know how. I think honestly that for, like you said, for as long as I've known, as long as I've lived, we've always been about tribe. Yeah. I'm not sure that we have ever truly been without, you know, without our tribes at the back of our minds. Yeah. I remember that, you know, I always knew I was Yoruba. I knew that, okay, and even within being a Yoruba person, there were times you were told, or you can't marry from this tribe. Or you, I mean, you can't marry from this part of this tribe. Imagine that kind of <laughs> issue. So when we now go to the bigger picture of Nigeria, and they are told, oh, you can't marry someone from that part of Nigeria, or someone from that part of tribe, Nigeria is called, those behaves like this. Or situations where you actually hear, we know when we're growing up, we used to have all those funny things where they would say, oh, these people eat food and they don't drink water. Or these people use their feet to kick their parents, or those other words. You know, so many snide remarks that we grew up with, literally speaking. Mm. And so that begs the question, did we really have a nation? And then there was something that was said that, that you said about the experiment, the social experiment yeah. by our colonial masters. masters. I don't know whether it's time to start advocating for separation. I don't know whether it's time to advocate for whatever it is that we're advocating for. But one thing that I do know is that as human beings, we cannot do without one another. Yeah. So whether we're going into different nations or we're staying together, we have to come into a system of governance that's going to be profitable for us, that's going to make sense so that people can have a sense of identity. Sure. And like Uche rightly said, a lot of young people don't know what it means to be called Nigerian again. They don't know what it means to have a sense of nationhood. Yes. And indeed, maybe we are just throwing the prevail bell can down, down the, the road. road. And I don't know what it is. It's certainly sometimes a depressing topic. I, I totally agree with both of you. Let me just um, um, bring the governance and leadership dimension to the debate. Because I, 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 I found out that 
the Buhari government has to a large extent helped to um, fund the embers of the division that we are witnessing today. I know Nigeria has not been, well, we've not been that united, but yeah. the deliberate steps of this government has to a large extent um, um, forced that sense of exclusion, whereby some persons mm. are now, okay, I don't understand what is going on here. I will say part of this, um, yeah. uh, this country. So since we understand that how elusive this can be, what it means is that it even takes more deliberate leadership steps from people who we elect into power. True. Who will be yeah. conscious of the, um, the pluralistic nature of the Nigerian society mm -hmm. and try, as a matter of fact, the framers of the constitution, they were not fools when they enacted section 14, subsection 2A, mm. that this would be federal character. The, it was in the consciousness of the nature yes, of the of country. that unification. Mm. Whereby, for there to be that sense of nationhood, nationhood every person unity. should be should be seen to be involved in the process. Seen to be yes. in the operative word. Yes, because when that is not the case, pretty much every other thing crumbles because everything has to rest on, there has to be a nation before mm. any other thing can happen. So you might be building red fry from here to wherever. When the people in the country mm. are not actually happy being in it. Mm. But, but do you know, do you think that the whole concept of federal character has actually helped with regards to the development of our nation? Well, <laughs> I'll answer in this way. People have argued that should we do federal character for the sake of it? But my response is, we can actually get meritocracy within, within the, federal. The, the framework of federal character principle. You know, so recent, interesting that we're having this conversation, and I just remembered something that was said now. I mean, I, I was on my status before this conversation occurred, there was a person that was talking about the issue of Nigeria and how, okay, so when you're, you'll get quali you're qualified, you have a degree, you have your master's and everything yes. as a person from any part of Nigeria, and you go and apply for a job, yeah. and you're told, oh, sorry, maybe you need to go and get some other things, mm -hmm. while somebody else who's from the, uh, from maybe from the northern region yeah. of Nigeria goes there, and the person yes, is yes. like, oh, whatever qualification, oh, come in, and then gets the job, mm -hmm. makes money from the job, and then is able to further push to further their education. But the point that the person made, which was very unusual, mm -hmm. was actually a call to the southern part of Nigeria that in other in the northern part of Nigeria you find that people it's literally like a communal sense of of of, of um engagement. Okay. And the person was pushing for the fact that I mean totally away from governance and nationhood. But I it struck me because one thing I have seen like I said when I started was that even within us uh, within uh, within Nigeria and within mm. the different tribes, we have those mm. things. That yeah. How many of us actually really, truly, like, you know, build each other or pull each other okay. up? How okay. about that sense of okay. communalism? Okay. Now, this is talking about federal character and meritocracy. Yes. Because yes. you find that one of the things that happened was that uh, in the federal character system, we're a part of Nigeria, and I'm very careful not to do the north-south divide because mm -hmm. I literally avoid those kind of conversations, Conversation. but we do know what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where the standards for, the, for meritocracy were not achievable, they literally just pulled themselves up. Yeah. Yeah. And so in pulling themselves up yeah. and giving, them a, giving themselves a leg up, yes. they're able to finally bridge the they gap. They have that edge. Yes. You know, you think, what they've done is, one thing I have discovered is that we may not realize it, but it's, you know, there's something about strategy. So even if they came in from this level of understanding, mm -hmm. or my educational qualification was just school cert. Yes. Within 15 to 20 years, yes. that same person who entered the system with school cert mm -hmm. actually goes to school yes. and gets to the highest level of their education yes. and becomes competent. Yes. While maybe we started with the fact that, okay, I've gotten my master's degree, mm -hmm. I've gotten, a, I mean, I have a PhD yes. and all that. But so maybe, just maybe, mm -hmm. for federal character, because right now we don't have anything that is saying that anything is changing. So because we have to find a solution in the system we're in maybe we might start to clamor for the fact that on my simple very simple non-governance ask say how about we start to look at how do we actually build ourselves we the marginalized supposed <laughs> marginalized <laughs> people so you need for that to happen there has to be a complete change of mindset fantastic you have to understand that you know let's use the regions the southeast already believes that they are marginalized yes. from the top to the region. bottom yes. and so what they do um, and what and i suppose every region is to say okay do you know what where is the space that is my own that i can own mm -hmm. and so they'll focus on trade and commerce right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and will not go after those opportunities that you speak about Fantastic. so yeah. that bringing up is not going to happen they would say mm. listen that door has been closed to you by virtue of the way the country has been run mm -hmm. for years so yeah. why are you wasting your time yeah. so go focus on your focus where you know that yeah. you're going to edge. you have an edge mm -hmm. yeah. so there's a complete mindset reorientation mm -hmm. that needs to happen right i 
I'm a South, like I said, I'm a South Easterner, and I, I've lived in and worked in Lagos for a very long time. I'm always the, probably the only South Easterner at, in a room. Mm. Okay. Many times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, those doors have been closed to us, mm. unfortunately, yeah. mentally. Yeah. So we need to start to re-educate people. And the only way people can believe it is if at the leadership top, you talked about governance and yes. leadership, yes. there is actually a demonstration yes. that we are trying to create an inclusive um, environment System. for everyone. Yes. People will tell you, look at all the heads of the, you know, parastatals yes. in mm -hmm. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They all come from one part of the, the country. Mm -hmm. So that tells you something. So people mm -hmm. are like, aha. Mm -hmm. So how do you believe that there's going to be a chance for me. Mm, exactly. So when we are voting next time, yes. right, we need to be careful how we vote. Very we true. need to be strategic. We need to be looking at leaders that have demonstrated yeah. that they truly, truly understand the whole concept of federalism. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, what is a nation? It's a group yeah. of people, you know, gathered together yeah. for one common vision. And what is the vision of Nigeria? I don't know it. That's you it. Know it. That's it. How many of us know it, actually? <laughs> I mean, how many of us really know it? And maybe that really is the question now. What our foundations what are might we be for, What are we working towards? Because mm -hmm. if the three of us believe are working towards one goal that benefits all of us, mm -hmm. it won't matter okay. where we're from. <laughs> Well, I guess this conversation will not end yeah, and it yes, will still yes, continue yes, going yes, on. certainly. Hmm. And I, I'm happy that she ended with that note of leadership. And as we approach the 2023 election, I hope Nigerians should have that focus in mind of electing a leader who will have that sense of inclusion for We hope so, too. And sundry. We truly hope That's so. That's our prayer. On last week's episode, Milo Moore says, education and inclusion is everything. Thanks for the report. Antonia Alebiosu says, this is quite insightful. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocates NG, or on Instagram, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocates NG. Anytime, it's next after the break. Do stay with us. The many social cultures of Nigeria. If you don't eat fruits, you'll die of cancer. If you don't do this, this will happen to you. Why is the Nigerian way of life to instill fear in you to ensure compliance or as a marketing tool? And I'm going away from all we've talking about on governance, on disabilities, and to some light-headed banter. You know, I'm genuinely triggered by the negativity loop that is consistently manipulated in our society. And I personally look forward to an era where we actually appeal to a higher emotional tug. But there is a particular societal slant I want to talk to today. And that is the culture of I must marry or you must marry. If you don't marry before 30, your eggs will die. If you are not a married man by 35, you are irresponsible. Hmm. Why are you rushing to get married is my question today. Well, I'm going to state up front that I think that weddings are so beautiful looking and the glam and the glitz is to die for. And oh, marriages can be bliss on earth and full of sugar and spice, you know, all things yum and so sweet. But... A beautiful wedding day is easy to plan and you can have whatever your budget can afford. But can you have the marriage of your dreams based on your budget? The Nigerian society is one that places a premium on one's marital status. And I'm sure that as you are watching right now, an irate mother is frantically calling her son to ask yet again, when he's coming to introduce his wife to be to her. And Daddy Dearest is sitting in the parlor expressing his displeasure to his friend that his 34 year old graduate daughter is busy chasing her career, breaking glass ceilings. He doesn't understand that at all. Making a lot of money for what? But without a single thought about settling down with a man and having children. What a mess. Now, not many people actually put much thought into the fact that marriage calls for skills, 
great and is striving for something akin to perfection in managing each other's, each other's persons and expectations. Let's look at all the other perpetrators of the Mary Now culture. Friends, oh dear friends, they are just as bad as the parents, especially when one by one, crew members start tying a knot. Suddenly, all eyes are on you to walk down the aisle as well. Talk about pressure. And sometimes, it's that pressure that leads people into relationships and marriages they have no business being in. Truth be told, oftentimes, the actions are carried out with the best intentions, and while some would almost shame you into marrying, others do it so subtly and even unintentionally. But some people, on the other hand, have set goals and so have placed themselves under personal pressures to get married. And while we're on it, let's not forget the great social media. Coupled with age, your age hang-ups, and the busybody aunts and uncles, aka family members, who have set up a weekly schedule to remind you that your biological clock is ticking like the timer on a bomb. Well, one thing that all those pressure groups, as that is what they are, don't factor in, is that the timelines of each and every one of us differ. What applies to you may not apply to me. So I would say today, know this and know peace. And so while you want all your hot pictures on the gram, there's a ton of work that you must put in behind the scenes. Are we ready for that? Getting married, having babies, doing all the amazing public display of affection for social media and all the other great things is what every one of us desires. Well, maybe almost all of us. But are we all ready for it? It appears that a lot of people are yet to understand this. Or maybe they know and they are just not ready to think about it. Well, it's important that they take note that the rate of divorce today is attesting to this. Marriages are crashing every other day. So stop press. Jumping in with both feet without proper planning, financial, mental and emotional stability is like taking a shovel and digging a pit for yourself. And sadly, that pit may widen and worsen till it swallows the person up whole unless there's an intervention. And at that point in time, where are all the pressure group members, the aunties, the uncles, the daddies, the mummies, the sisters, or those friends that were pressuring you to marry? You find that it's just you. Thinking about getting married when you're not even self-sufficient is a catastrophic state of mind. So is planning to get married without having taken charge of your emotions. I'm going to ask you today, how wise and sensible are you with money? And we know that what Nigeria is talking about today. How about that temper? That, you know, we're fighting, gen, we're fighting domestic violence today. What is it without your bad mouth? Everything, your mouth runs. Anything you say, what comes into your mouth as you want to say it. Do you even know the level of importance that's attached to getting married? Or is it just because everyone else is doing it? You know, let's ask ourselves, do you have any idea about birth control? Or do you want to be popping babies out every year? Do you have money-making ideas? In today's Nigeria, I repeat once again. Now, without filling in all the necessary emotional, financial, and mental boxes, no one should be thinking of a marriage. I say, are you trustworthy? Do you know how to trust somebody? Do you even understand about sexual compatibility? Have you had the talk about what you like or what you don't like? Does your partner know or possess traits that you may not even be able to deal with? Because most people just want to get married to somebody without even thinking about what the other person wants. And I would like to say here, it is not enough to love someone. Do not be fooled. Love is never enough. There are so many boxes to fill and check before you could even think about being self-ready for a successful marriage, a lifetime of togetherness. And while a dramatic proposal is definitely interesting and to be talked about, it is not the guarantee for an amazing marriage. And sadly, a lot of marriages that have not yet crashed are simply being held together for many various reasons, from the children, to what people will say, to what will happen to me if I leave you, and sometimes just to keep up appearances. I would say if you're listening to me today, and you know deep within you that you're nowhere close to actually being ready for marriage, 
I would ask you once again, why are you rushing to get married? Is it about getting married or actually having a sense of personal responsibility? Do you have an understanding of your life and what marriage really means to you as a person or to your society in whole? <laughs> and it's on. So, uh, are you trying to scare people from getting married? <laughs> <laughs> I think I am simply trying to let people a, realize that a there's a lot of responsibility attached to it. And not just financial. Yeah. I discovered that for people, they feel like, especially men, I'm Nigerian men. Mm. You have hit that big to you have some money. You are living on your own. How dare you not go and marry? Go and bring a wife and I'm going to take up the house for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, do you think that it comes, it has to do with our. Uh, for me, I, I, when it comes to marriage, there is always a cultural and a religious intersection, mm. right? You know, the whole concept of, you know, going to the world, multiply, have Inclusion. dominion. For sure. you to multiply means you have to get married because in our culture, <laughs> yes. children come as a byproduct of, of, marriage. of, of a marriage. Mm. So, that, so the, the real focus for many of these parents and pressure groups is that cute niece, nephew, the grandchild. Mm. It's not necessarily because they want to see you they see your bling ring or they see you in a home. They just, mm. they need you to go in there because you need, you need, it's, a child comes from that, you know, process. from, from that process, mm. okay? But, you know, to be on a serious note though, because of the high rate of divorces, right? I'm going to agree with you on this one completely. It's, divorce, divorces leave a negative impact on the couple as well as the children, mm. if not handled very carefully. Mm. There's a lot of baggage that comes with it. There's a lot of bitterness, you know. Um, and if it can be avoided, right, yeah. really, it's better to wait than make a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, the pressure comes from people just trying to do what is a natural progression of life. Mm. So many times now, I actually find that the pressure is no longer coming from the families. In recent times, for a lot of people, the pressure is actually coming from themselves. themselves. So you have two schools of two, two groups now. The people who have put themselves under pressure because it's the natural progression of life. I'm out of university. I have a job. It's time for me to get married. And then you have the ones where the families are making comments like, what are you going to do? But then you also have a group of people now who are deciding that, you know what? Marriage and children is not an option for me. And um, That's what I'm discovering too. People are saying yes. that. And people are starting to say that it's not an option for me. And, and, and I think there's also also something that married people need to do better at, and that is speaking about the good sides of marriage. What mm. you find now is that a lot of people go into marriage with a lot of baggage, other people's baggage, not their baggage. Mm -hmm. They've seen marriages around them feel. Mm -hmm. So they've come with that thing of, oh, I've heard something bad happened to my friend. I say, eh, when I marry, I'm not going to take that. Mm. So you already go in, guns blazing, mm -hmm. right? Your, your, your tentacles are already up, you're already paranoid, and so something that you may have handled in a particular way, you handled it with force and aggression, mm. and of course, that's not going to work. Um, love is a decision, okay? It's not a feeling. So when people are going to marriage on the basis of love, and I ask them, what does it mean when you Good say question. that you are in love, right? Mm -hmm. They're never able to articulate it because it's a feeling. Mm. If you are able to articulate it, then I know that you're onto something because love is a decision. That's love true. is deciding that I'm going to tolerate that mistake that mm. you're going to make. I'm going to think of the worst case scenario. What's the worst thing that you're going to do? And I'm staying within the confines of, please, let's stay out of domestic violence, you know, things like yeah. that. Mm. But I'm thinking, what's the worst thing that you're going to do? Am I going to still be able to forgive you? Am I going to be able to stay with you when there's no money, right? Am I going to take on your battles? Are we working towards a vision? Mm. So it doesn't have anything to do with a feeling. It mm. has to do with a decision that I'm going to walk this journey with you. And until people are able to answer those questions carefully and intelligently, not, oh, I like the way he or she makes me feel. And they're not ready. <laughs> yeah. That's the truth. True and they that. better, very they true. better yeah. wait. Yeah. You know. Well, um, you know, it's quite a very, uh, like I said before now, it's a whole lot brought into one kit. Um, the whole marriage institution, the love aspects to it, mm. and the societal pressure that, um, that comes with it particularly for um, people of my generation who, like you pointed out, that when you're not done with your university, perhaps you got a master's degree, you're not working and earning some money. Mm -hmm. The natural expectation yeah. is actually talking about getting mm -hmm. married mm -hmm. and all of that. And um, beyond that natural expectation that is forced on us by, that's a function of society we all live. Mm. You understand? And it's not necessarily bad, if you ask me. Okay. It's not necessarily bad that 
when you begin to attain a certain age, people, your uh, friends, family, will be, let me not say as they will be interested in knowing when you're not eventually going to settle down and then perhaps open the, the chapter of your own family. It's a function of our, of our cultural experience. Yeah. You understand? Mm -hmm. yeah. And even in the Bible, even in the Bible, like she pointed out, the Bible also ordains that institution. That the man, the woman has to live and together they become wife and procreate, fill the earth and multiply. So there's a cultural and religious um, basis for this. What I see that happened now is how society has made it as though they have now, they don't allow it to happen, to just happen from the standpoint of the individual. That's where I'm going to. the individual That's the point. coming yes. to the realization that, okay, now I think I should now start up something. It should come from the individual. When it is now being forced from the societal pressure and family, it causes the problem that makes someone to now perhaps rush into it. And most time, when you rush into it, you also rush out you of rush it. Out. As you say, we court. If you rush to court, <laughs> you, know, you rush out of court. So those those are the issues, and I think um, we have to actually we should not um, we should not um, be drawn into all the bedlam out there. People should you be know, people should know what they want and know when to start this institution of marriage if they feel they, they, they need it. Yes, yeah, I, I I quite agree with both of you, but I think the part that I am beginning to, well, maybe personally see and to talk to is the fact that, like Uche rightly said, if feelings and emotions have taken on the decision making. But you know, one of the things, I mean, and this is totally away from the fact that it's a societal norm, life skills around decision making, critical thinking, as well as emotional intelligence, you mm -hmm. know, understanding of how people relate. We are not taking in the, the thinking part of decision making. This is a lifelong decision. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that rather than be moved by societal mm -hmm. norms yes. or pressures within you mm -hmm. or your sense of expectation, yes. to take in that cold eye review of what you want to. To get do. into. Yes. I mean, how many of us actually understand the other person? You know, when we talk about wife material or husband material, we look at things like I can tolerate his excesses. Mm -hmm. But have I ever actually thought of what actions or remedies or steps I want to use to tolerate those person's those excesses person's or not? Ex Who is that person? But then, you know, I mean, these conversations that we're having today mm -hmm. could go on and mm -hmm. on, and I'm sure they're really triggering conversations. Yeah, yeah, because there's an economic something. dimension to why people get married. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you know that. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. If I could just chip in something, there was something um, um, uh, Chimaman Dangoza just said sometime that there is no timeliness to success. So for those who have seen marriage as a sort of a prize or as a huge prize which must be won, they should know that there is no timeliness to it. She said a law degree that's gotten four years later and one got him four, four years earlier. They are all law okay. degree. Fantastic. Very true. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raymond, for that. Mm, yeah. Well, we have come to the end of today's episode. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG, or on Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the, uh, the advocate NG. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station, let's keep advocating for a better society. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.